And welcome. My name is Bianca Collins. I'm the curator of public programs for the Fowler Museum at UCLA. Thank you for joining us today, this afternoon or tonight, depending on where it is you're tuning in from across the world. Today's program, Love, Divinities, and Voodoo Art, is generously supported by a grant from the Lilly Endowment Incorporated as part of the Fowler's Lunch and Learn series, which offers easily digestible explorations of charismatic objects from around the world found in our permanent collection. I'm so pleased that you've joined us to chew on some sustenance and feed your mind during your lunch break. Today, Catherine Smith, the Fowler's Curatorial and Research Associate of Haitian Art, We'll explore an altar assemblage by sculptor Samuel Francois. Catherine is also a lecturer in the departments of World Arts and Cultures Dance and Art History at UCLA. Her research explores the intersection of art, religion, and urban migration in Haiti and the Black Atlantic. Before we get going, two quick bits of technical notes. Once the screen sharing begins, I encourage you to click view options at the top of your screen and then select side by side mode so that the video feed doesn't cover any of the presentation. If you have any questions during this program, please submit them through the Q&A function found at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can submit and upvote questions that you would like to be considered to be answered at the end of the program. All right, that's enough from me. Over to you, Kathy. Hi, thank you, Bianca, and welcome everyone to our Zoom room. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen here. Okay, so when Bianca invited me here to share with you this lunch and learn, um, I immediately thought of this piece, which is kind of an old friend at this point. Um, this is a work, La Sirene and the Azalea of the Waters by Samuel Francois, that I first encountered in about 2000 um, in the Iron Market of Port-au-Prince. It was uh, the same time that I met uh, Marilyn Holberg, a art historian and anthropologist um, who had worked most of her career at the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, and at that time she was in Port-au-Prince curating an exhibition at the Musée d'Art Haïtienne, the sort of central art museum in Port-au-Prince. And uh, for me at the time, I was young, I was uh, kind of doing an internship in Haiti and, um, you know, Marilyn had sort of asked, do you want to help out with this exhibit? And, you know, of course I, I jumped on the opportunity as it was uh, the art of Haiti and specifically the art of voodoo that had um, brought me to Haiti in the first place. Um, and part of the Fowler's own, you know, sacred arts of Haitian voodoo that um, is, you know, responsible for that turn in my life's path. So I first met this piece at about the same time I met Marilyn. And um, Marilyn was working on this exhibit that would bring the sequined arts of Haiti into Le Musée d'Art. Le Musée d'Art at that time had a director who was not particularly interested in highlighting uh, the sequined arts or the popular arts of Haiti, but was, had been focused much more on artists who had been trained in formal art institutions, right? That and focused on glorifying the so-called Renaissance of Haiti's past, right? Artists who had been working in the 1940s and the 1950s. And um, Marilyn, what I saw is that she had kind of leveraged her privilege as a foreigner, and as a white woman, uh, she had leveraged that privilege to bring these artists who were operating out of the iron market in Port-au-Prince, who were operating out of Unfor, that is uh, voodoo temples, um, artists who had not gone to art school, artists who were from the majority class, uh, and, and introduce a little bit of chaos into the Musée d'Art uh, to invite the market into the museum and to hand over a lot of curatorial control to the artists themselves. And it was a small exhibit uh, that lasted a short time. There were no publications associated with it, but it was, a, 
it was an encounter that made a huge impression on me. And I remember this piece in particular, uh, seeing school children come into the museum on sort of their field trips and encountering um, something that was much brighter uh, and much more lively than um, a lot of the exhibits that had been going on at the Musée des Art. Um, a lot of the things that had focused on sculpture and, and painting um, that the sequence had really grabbed, uh, in this case, a, a group of schoolgirls that had come to tour that, you know, really transfixed uh, these kids. And so that's when I got to know this, this piece. And at that time, I met uh, the artist, Samuel Francois. And, you know, one of, one of my big regrets as uh, someone who has done field work in Haiti and has lived in Haiti extensively is that I didn't actually get to know him, that this piece I would come to know quite well, um, but I did not actually get to know the artist. Um, the piece eventually, Marilyn bought it, brought it home, and it lived in her own house, which was itself um, a art collection and uh, market. Um, it stayed there for years until she decided to sort of pass it on to the Fowler Museum. And so uh, when I began working here at the Fowler Museum in July and going through the collections, uh, I was delighted to encounter it again. So um, I wanna start by sort of introducing our loi, our, our spirits, our divinities here. We start at the top with La Sirene, sometimes translated as a mermaid, but is the divinity associated with water, but with those aspects of water that are unknowable. They're unknowable and unattainable in your waking life. Uh, scholars like Henry Drewell have pointed out that um, the reverence and the worship of La Sirene and Mami Wata, as we sort of know it today, traces its roots to the transatlantic slave trade. Um, and so La Sirene comes out of the wealth of the waters, but it also, she also comes out of the loss, right? Those things lost in the trade, um, which include lives um, and all of the mysteries that go with them, the ships, the gold, uh, the potential. Um, she's, she's always that thing under the water that you'll never fully know. Right, that which remains, that which you long for because it is unattainable, right? And here the artist has rendered her as white, right? Perhaps it's an ideal that is always mixed with pain, with unattainability. If you are um, of the Haitian majority class and um, disenfranchised in that way. Uh, but also in plastic, right? I think that we have to pay attention to the very materiality of this work, that it's shiny and it represents a certain ideal of beauty, but it is also fundamentally plastic, right? Um, the hair is acrylic uh, and false hair. Um, all that shines here that looks like gold is not in fact gold, right? And you can kind of compare that to this work, Mariage La Sirene et Agüe. Agüe is her male consort, who also represents the sea, but perhaps uh, the navigation of the sea, right? Um, but front and center is La Sirene. And you can see, you can learn something about the deity by looking at Alcide's representation of her, right? You can see the sort of lavish wedding cake, the dress with all of the embroidery. You can see that she is attended to by other uh, mermaids, by angels, by music, right? That um, this is a representation of luxury that um, is always sort of more than you can attain, more than you can reach, something that remains on the other side of the waters, right? And maybe, maybe you can get there in your dreams, but it's not something that's available in your waking life. Here is Erzili Frida. Now, 
in representations of Loire, I've noticed that most often they're pictured not as singular beings, but as part of a family, right? You learn something about an individual by seeing who their family is and who they associate with. So um, in this piece, we're talking about two spirits that are closely related. And this is Azeli Frida, who is, you know, often described as like the goddess of love. But one of the things that's sort of interesting about uh, voodoo theology is that there's all these different kinds of love. And Erzili represents um, sort of the pain at not having enough, of always wanting more. Um, and in that way, she is sort of related to Erzili Frida, that um, the kind of luxury and splendor and opulence that artist has rendered her with here in sequins and beads and a golden white face um, that that always remains kind of unattainable. But what I think is really interesting here in this particular piece is that he has rendered her sort of draped in an American flag. And um, I think that speaks of an idea that, you know, there's, there's a promise in immigration and going abroad in crossing over those waters that life will be better. That those sort of foreign luxuries um, like champagne and diamonds, and, you know, these things that um, you're not going to find at the marketplace commonly, uh, that those things are available on the other side of the water. And here Azili is draped in an American flag. I mean, again, I want to point out that this is a representation in plastic and maybe, maybe we can read a kind of critique into that, right? That um, loa are never perfect, they're never transcendent. And it's not so much that you want to be like them, but you want to learn from them, right? Um, so there's always a cautionary tale. Again, here is a representation of Erzeli Freda by the artist Milan Constant, made just a few years after our Love Goddess piece. And um, this is a copy of the Catholic chromolithograph, uh, the sort of Catholic image that you could purchase in the marketplace that is massively reproduced. And, um, you know, the, the Catholic representation shows that this is a representation and interpretation of the Virgin Mary um, who suffers, you know, in spite of all of the wealth and the gifts and the gilding, uh, in spite of the crowns and the glory, um, she suffers. But I wanna compare that to this interpretation of Erzili Freda Ezili intercepted by Edouard Duval Carrier, made in 1996, just a few years before uh, Francois's work, where um, this poor woman, maybe she is Ezili, or maybe it is a human who is uh, embodying the spirit of Ezili. Uh, that, that dream of going north, that dream of the wealth that lies on the other side of the waters has encountered sort of the violence of US imperialism and the violence of borders, of maritime borders. And you see here how confused and befuddled she is when she is encountering these white US Coast Guard personnel. So compare that to this, compare that to our poor Ezeli here and her heart pierced um, as she is sort of surrounded in, you know, this almost like parade float, right? Like a beauty queen on a parade float whose heart has been pierced. Right. So we wanna shift gears and talk a little bit about where, where the artist is coming from. My knowledge of him uh, is limited, I regret, but I can talk a little bit about uh, the context that he is coming out of, and I can talk a little bit about the market. Um, this is the iron market. As I said, this is where I first encountered the piece, and this is where I first met the artist um, and Piero Barra, his mentor, which I'll talk to, I'll talk about in just a second. Um, this is the iron market, which is right sort of in the middle of the oldest downtown part of uh, the city. It was built in 1897 by President Hippolyte. Apparently, it was built as a railway station in Paris, um, and it was meant to go to Cairo. Uh, for whatever uh, 
reasons it did not end up there, but ended up in Port-au-Prince. Uh, Hippolyte is sort of known for making a handful of these iron markets, um, Jacques Mel and Cap Haitian, uh, but this, this was sort of the largest. And this is an image of it closer to the present. Um, you know, it's a bit of a cliche to say that a market is the world in microcosm, but it certainly is true or close to true that the iron market is Port-au-Prince in microcosm. Um, it is a vast and dense, as you can see, market full of everything. It's full of food, both imported, but also local. It is a place where you buy magical supplies if you are serving the Loire or just having a little bit of mystical work done. It is a place where you can buy national products like clothing, right? Locally made clothes, locally made leather goods. You can also buy imported used clothes or imported new clothes. Um, anything that you need, you can find somewhere in the iron market, um, as well as just a dense mass of bodies um, plying their trade and um, looking for opportunities, looking for work, right? Um, as we go into the market, uh, you can see the kind of density of where is the density and the diversity. Uh, on the left, um, you see a mix of both things made for tourists but also the kinds of things that would be made for people who serve the loa, right? Uh, the goods that are necessary to practice voodoo. On the right, you can see a section that sells beauty products. Um, on the back here, you, on the back of the image on the right, you can see, um, you can see hair that would be used for weaves or, or wigs. Um, and then you can see, you know, different, jewelry and clothes, um, very much the kind of section that an artist like Samuel Francois would, would visit in looking for um, works to sort of put together this piece, right? Um, you can see here, these are um, images of a stall that sells uh, goods that might be used in voodoo. Um, you can see in the front of the left, an assault. Right. Um, oh, sorry. You can also see perfume, which is very common. Um, and then on the image on the upper right, you can see works that could, could be used in an ufor, or they could be something that is used for uh, a tourist um, that could be considered art. But the point is you begin to see that the lines between, you know, on the left here, goods for tourists, um, goods for people who want to serve the loa with perfume and alcohol and decorated bottles and sacred beads, and then art itself, that all of these lines are sort of mixed up, right? Um, what is for tourists? What is for voodoo? And then finally, what, what is considered high art? Right? When you break down those barriers and bring the market into the museum and you begin to elevate the amazing work by some of the people working in the market, um, then it further sort of blurs these boundaries. To me though, what's more interesting than thinking in terms of different categories is uh, to think about the process and how artists come to make their work. Um, so what is the transmission and the transformation of tradition. Um, oh, apologies, I got out of order here. I wanted to just show um, that this work by Samuel Francois is among other things, an altar unto itself, an altar to these two lois, these two goddesses of love. Um, but you can see here where it's sort of coming from, right? Um, that it comes from uh, actual living use it, used altars. So you can see in the center of this one, this is a altar for a loi Erzili Dantor, who is sort of the um, other face of feminine love, uh, other than uh, Erzili Freda. Uh, as you can see, 
um, a different color schema and a different feeling, a different ambience. Um, but you see here a doll at the very center of it. Um, and you can see other ritual accoutrements. To the left, you can see um, a drapeau voodoo, a voodoo flag. Um, you can see on the upper left two assons. Let's look back here, an assons in the marketplace, an assons right here in the upper left um, in an enfant, in a temple, um, as well as the kinds of um, enamel uh, cups and saucers that you would also buy at the marketplace, right? Um, here you can see a detail of the doll with another doll to her right uh, and Pake Congo, which are uh, mystical, um, mystical bundles uh, used for magic and initiation. But all things that if you were either making them yourself, uh, you would buy the materials at the market or you would buy them ready-made at the market. So, okay. As I was saying, what I think is more interesting than actually sort of parsing out what is for tourists, what is for voodoo, um, and what is considered high art is to sort of look at the processes by which these things are made. Um, and this is a work by uh, Piero Barra. Um, Piero Barra is an artist who, these kinds of goods that were used in voodoo, right, are made in the market. And um, Piero Barra was the first artist to really begin taking them a little bit farther, right? So taking the, the bottles that we saw on the altar, um, taking the paquet congo, these sort of sacred packets, and turning them into um, pieces that were just more. I don't know how to say it, but that uh, had more, uh, more detail, more power, were much more elaborate, right? And these sort of were picked up by art historians like Marilyn Holberg, like Donald Cosentino, um, and uh, I believe first brought into the Fowler Museum. But here is a work by Piero Barra uh, called Bawan Sandi. The Bawan Sandi, that's the name of a loa, a spirit who is associated with uh, death and the cemeteries. This is um, from the early 90s. Hold on, I'm having a little technical problem here. Okay, good. Okay, uh, this is another piece from 1993 by Piero Barra by another incredibly hot, fiery feminine spirit uh, named Santa Marta uh, with a snake that does her bidding, a snake spirit. Um, but Piero Barra begins to, in the early 90s, begins to get some international recognition. He begins to become um, successful financially. And uh, so he takes on apprentices. And that's sort of where we get to with um, Francois. Uh, and, you know, this is sort of part of the story of Haitian art that I think um, often doesn't get told that artists like this are sort of considered or described often as untrained, right? So-called untrained artist. And um, what we see here is that it's not so much that uh, Francois was so-called untrained, right? That uh, it's rather that he served as an apprentice to a master artist and began um, by helping Barra with his own work. Uh, but also, of course, by just being in the iron market, by being a student of the iron market itself, and seeing that intersection between um, shopping and consumption and the aesthetic practices of altars and began sort of putting them into his own work and eventually developing his own aesthetic, which I think you can kind of see the contrast between these works that have uh, darker colors um, that often deal with hotter spirits. Um, and this, which is sort of a piece that to me speaks of desire, this speaks of sort of shine and glitz and things like this. Um, 
but that uh, rather than thinking of him as perhaps an untrained artist, to think instead about him as um, a student, both of Barra, but then of the market world at large. Um, and at that, I'd kind of rather just open it up to a, a dialogue to answer some questions, because um, I see there are a lot popping up in the Q&A. So. Yes, thank you so much, Kathy, for taking on taking us on that journey to Port-au-Prince to learn more about Haiti's rich visual culture. Um, we've got, like you said, some questions coming in. We've only got time for a couple, so let's get right to it. Um, okay. Can you explain why the market is called the iron market, Marla Burns asks. It's, is it about the construction materials or the presence of Haitian blacksmiths making works of iron? Oh, that's a great question. The Marché en fer. Okay. Um, you know, as far as I know, uh, it has always been called that because it is made out of iron. Um, I, there is a tradition of, there's a tradition of working metal that exists um, outside of downtown, actually in a suburb of the city, Croix de Bouquet, of reworking used metals. Uh, there is or was also more of like a blacksmithing tradition but um, that also not based in the market. As far as I know, it really is called the Marché en Fer because it's made out of metal. And there is this story, which I've always heard and I don't know like what the archival sources are, but that it was created as um, a train station, which you can kind of see. Um, yeah. Awesome, thank you. Then we have a question from uh, Mika Lili Lior. She says, thank you for the insightful talk. As a dance scholar, she's curious about the relationships between the museum pieces and the altar pieces you discuss and the embodiments of the Loire. Would the ones considered more hot have different qualities in their dances or embodiments? And would the altar pieces be nourished in some way um, before or in relation to an embodiment practice? Oh, great question. Okay, so um, absolutely. There is an aesthetic difference between the loa, the spirits that are considered hot, and the ones that are considered cool. So um, when you look at the two different representations of, um, so here uh, Samuel Francois, these are these are cool spirits, and you know you see you see gold and you see white, um, versus here you know a hot spirit. You see much more red, you see black. Um, again, with this altar, uh, you see red and you see black. And that's, um, that comes across in uh, the music as well, that for the hotter spirits, you would have faster, more staccato kinds of rhythms uh, and movements. Whereas with the cool spirits, um, you have a much sort of um, just softer rolling rhythm and movements that uh, flow bit more gently. So Samuel Francois is working with spirits that are cooler, obviously. Um, and then there was a second part of the question about would the altar pieces be nourished in some way before or in relation to an embodiment practice? Um, also a great question. So the piece that you see here by Samuel Francois uh, was not in any way spiritually charged? Like the answer is yes, it could be. Like with this representation, there is not something in it that is inherently powerful. It has to be made powerful. Mm. So the difference between this, uh, which was bought by a collector and taken to the US, but um, to the best of my knowledge, it was never spiritually charged. No um, offerings were made to it. No spirits were invited to inhabit it. Um, and then you see a doll like this, which is a living part of an altar. Um, this doll almost certainly would be fed and cared for and considered uh, a spirit embodying material, right? Um, but that's the difference between, you know, an object that is, goes off to live in a museum and an object that goes to live in an ufor. Same object, but different biographies, right? Uh, a thing becomes as sacred as you choose to make it, right? Yes, and similarly, Laurel was asking, or asking to confirm that these are used as altars, or are they also used as artworks just to be viewed? Yeah, so that's excellent. Um, you know, in this case, uh, as with a lot of the Pirobara pieces, uh, the inspiration comes from voodoo, 
but they are mostly made to be exported. That said, I can definitely think of examples where something of this type has been brought into an ufar and made into an altar and made into sacred something sacred. Um, I mean, to be honest, uh, a work like this um, by Francois um, would, would probably be rather expensive uh, for someone who just wants a home altar. Um, so its fate ends up kind of in the hands of um, a museum and ends up being sort of shipped north. Um, yeah. Thank you. Okay, well, we're at time, so we're gonna have to end here. But thank you so much, Kathy, for such an interesting 30 minutes um, teaching us all about the Haitian love divinities and the sources where artists are finding their materials in Porto Prince. Um, super interesting. And I'll send you this log of Q&A um, uh, submissions afterwards so you can review them and um, maybe answer some any questions left. Uh, unanswered here today. Um, thank you to everyone who joined us as well. This program has been recorded. It will be available immediately on our Facebook and in the next few days on our Instagram and on the Fowler website for you to revisit and share. And um, thank you to everyone who came. Uh, we hope you'll join us again for our next program. You can find details on the closing slide. Thanks again, okay. Kathy. Thanks so much. Have a great afternoon, everyone. <laughs>